Good evening. Welcome to our study tonight. I'm glad you can join us. Tonight, before I go in the news, in the, in, in the news, let me just encourage you. A lot of people love in the news and they want to be uh, updated, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but also, this study that I'm starting is in Jude, and uh, it's extremely prophetic. So if you could hang around and continue with this in that Jude study, I think you really like it. Let's start in the news. Of course, Israel is still in the news, obviously, with this ongoing war. Uh, this article says, looking at the big picture, America's adversaries are all connected. Now, that should hit us prophetically. We know that um, what, what I'm about to read to you is truly shocking, and I don't think anybody's reported this on any of the medias that I've heard. Russia was notified prior to the assault by Hamas, uh, the Hamas did in Israel. In order to keep, and I'm quoting, in order to keep the attack secret and successful, the different factions and our allies, one senior Hamas official said, did not know the zero hour, but Hamas did update Russia on its plans to attack Israel. So they knew it was coming. That should make you really wonder a little bit. Uh, we'll continue to develop that as it goes on. It says this, Russia was not the only ally Hamas informed of its plans on Saturday. Another quote, after half an hour of commencing the attack, all the Palestinian resistant factions were contacted, as were our allies in Hezbollah and Iran. They even notified Turkey, an increasingly rogue member of NATO, by the way, and met with them only three hours into the operation. Senior Hamas official Ali Baraka said, and goes on to say this, our allies are those that support us with weapons and money. First and foremost, it is Iran that gives us money and weapons to the tune of 110 million, he said. Barak also pointed to Hamas's close affinity with Hezbollah. The Hezbollah fired rockets at northern Israel on Tuesday, right after, right after the attack on Saturday, and continued to do it even up to today. And he goes and says this, Even Russia sympathizes with us, added Bar Baraka. Russia is happy that America is getting embroiled in Palestine. Of course it is. It's a two-front war now for America. Even though we're not fighting that war actively, we are separating ourselves and have less attention to put to the Ukraine. A new and looming axis of terror against the West centered around the Iranian regime, IR, regime's IRGC and Putin's Russia may very well be on the horizon. A spokesperson for the Israeli Foreign Ministry said Israel sees the invitation of senior Hamas officials to Moscow. They were invited to Moscow so shortly after the attack as an obscene step that gives the support to terrorism and legitimizes the atrocities of Hamas terrorists. The same actors, and even more of them, are aligned on Russia's side of the conflict in Ukraine. After Ukraine stalled Russia's first assault on the ground, down its... Uh, and ground down and its war machine with Western aid, Russia turned on the other bad actors to restock its supplies, including China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and even South, South Africa. They're supplying Moscow with military equipment and personnel. So we are watching something ratchet up here, looking at the big picture. In addition to military assistance, American rivals on the world stage also cooperate economically. I told you about the BRICS organization, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, an organization's second tier economic powers in the world are starting to, to come together. And they're going to be admitting in January of 2024, Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. So we're watching a one world uh, economics coming together. The organization, which includes some of the largest economies in Africa, Asia, and South America, is actively discussing ways to move international trade away from the U.S. dollar and toward other national currencies. President Bush called it out by name. He called it an axis of evil consisting of three countries. And now it's four, China, Russia, Korea, and Iran. Shifting alliances and changing power balances have changed the global situation once again. China's decade-long buildup and Russia's resurgence have placed the United States on the defensive in far-flung zones of influence. Part of this is from not recognizing the threat, and we haven't. We've been asleep uh, in, in the world, in the world um, affairs ever since Biden took office. America has largely let China's military buildup uh, go wild, and global funding and global fi friend buying projects go unanswered. And the U.S. has become consumed with internal divisions, with which other nations may have played a role in uh, aggravating. We stopped playing the game of keeping up with the rest of the world. We stopped playing the game of policing the rest of the world. Everyone else was playing the game. So whatever the reason why a growing coalition of global adversaries is arrayed against America, we can count on always being the unchallenged champion in an adversarial arena that incentivizes the rise of challengers. And it's called the Thucydides effect. A, a 
a Greek philosopher back in 300 AD, BC, excuse me, who said that nations that are second will always challenge that number one nation, especially when those challenges can combine together. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Which brings us, and that's the uh, chart for the axis of evil. And then I want to bring you to here. This, is, this article came out today. Magog rising. Turkey threatens intervention in Gaza. So if you're a prophecy, uh, if you're a prophecy follower, or a follower of prophecy, you should be aware of the Gog-Magog war. You should be aware of the Psalm 83 war. And of course, you should be aware of the war in Armageddon. These wars, all three of them, are yet to come. And we are very, very close, if not right at the door, at one of these wars. I'll let you decide, but let me give you a little bit of rundown of them. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan delivered a speech over the weekend at an anti-Israel rally in which he told attendees that Israel was responsible for war crimes and framed Hamas as freedom fighters. He then went on to further suggest that Turkey maybe need to intervene in Gaza, saying Turkey can come at any night unexpectedly. Think about this. To an ecstatic reception from the hundreds of thousands of attendees who chanted in response, Turkish military in Gaza, Turkish military in Gaza. Some experts are warning us that Erdogan is trying to appear, appear as the champion of, of Islam, much like Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini did in 1989. But historically, Turkey has been an ally of the United States and, and of Israel, and one of the more moderate Muslim nations in the world with Western-style democracy. Both of these concepts appear to have been thrown to the wind in recent years. Erdogan is a fundamentalist Sunni Muslim uh, through and through. He disdains democracy. One of his primary goals is to reestablish Turkey as the leader of the revived Roman Empire, Caliphate. Uh, the rise of Turkey's power and hostilities towards Israel aligns with, aligns with the key Bible prophecies related in the book of Ezekiel. And it will take place in the Middle East, Ezekiel tells us. Specifically predicts, Ezekiel does, chapter 38 and 39, that Turkey would be one of three primary enemies against Israel in the last days. We know the leaders of Russia, Gog, of Turkey, that's Togarmar and Gomer, and Iran, which is Persia, have had several meetings together in the last year. That, those are the three main nations that will come down in the Gog-Magog war. If Turkey were to become involved in a conflict with Israel, it would put the United States and NATO in a difficult position of supporting Israel while one of its own members attacks its, that state. Ezekiel warns that this invading coalition, referred to as Gog and Magog coalition, is brought into the region with a hook in its jaw, implying that there are some underlying circumstances that will force them into the region almost against their will. Obviously, the Gaza invasion and worldwide opposition could soon provide that hook that forces this coalition to mark. Remember, Ezekiel warned of this 2,600 years ago. So what does it mean? Well, quickly, without giving you a whole big rundown on it, this, these are the nations that would be involved in the Psalm 83 war. I encourage you to read Psalm 83 and see this coalition. So these are the old names. The new names are ones that you know today. Gibal is Syria. We know Tyre is Lebanon. We know the Hagarites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites. That's Jordan, which hasn't gone into the war yet, but today have taken their, their emissaries back from their, from, their, um, from their places in Israel. They took them all out uh, from, from Israel. Uh, Amalek, uh, the Philistia, Philistia that, that we know now is Gaza, and Assyria, that's, that's uh, Iran. So these are the nations that are lining up, and they're lining up right now. This is Psalm 83. If you went to Gog and Magog, you have Gomer and Togamar, that's Turkey. You have Magog, which is Russia, and Meshach and Tubal is really pretty much the upper part of, of Iran. And so they will go against Israel. They will attack them. Another war that's coming. So when we think about Bible prophecy, you have to know these wars. These have not yet happened. These nations have not coalesced yet against Israel together. And then, of course, there's the great war of Armageddon. And you can see the nations that will be pulled in there. So even if Armageddon is far off, seven years at least, away at the end of the tribulation, we know that nations right now, those aggressive nations will actually be some of the ones even in the Armageddon War, and so it, which will be a world war, by the way, and include much more than just the Middle East. So we're watching something that's prophetically significant, and it's happening right now. And again, you're not going to get that on CNN or NBC or even Fox. You're not going to get that. These are wars that are mentioned in Scripture. Benjamin Netanyahu has mentioned these wars as recently as two days ago. He knows his Bible. 
He knows that these wars are coming. He totally understands it and because it's the Old Testament. Now, let me give you a little bit more. So we know that some, that some other things are happening. This article is the scary generation gap views on Israel and Hamas. Somebody just asked me this today. Why are so many Americans and people, young people around the world against Israel? Well, just listen to this article. This month's Harvard Caps Harris poll shows a wide divide has grown. Asked whether they support Israel or Hamas, those over 65 years of age sided with Israel, 95%. The generations who in their day protested the Vietnam War and lived through the Watergate scandal are nearly universally siding with Israel right now. So let's look at the views of those ages 18 to 24. They support Israel over Hamas by the thinnest of margins, 52 to 48. These students were mostly born after 9-11, have no memory of when America was attacked. They miss Schindler's List, have little to, or no connection to World War II or the Holocaust. They simply have little or no, to no knowledge about the extermination of six million Jews in gas chambers and the post-war return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. Ask the most basic facts about the controversy today. Many of these young people fail the test miserably. When asked if Hamas killed 1,400 innocent civilians, 39% of this college age group said it never happened. It just happened two weeks ago, but they're denying it. A majority of 53% believe that Israel, not Hamas, has been ruling Gaza. And 45% believe that Israel bombed the Gaza hospital, despite all the clear evidence to show the contrary. And by the way, Israel doesn't rule Gaza. They gave them their own rule back in 2006. Young people generally consume their news online. There's your problem. And the re results underscore how easily our young can be misled. So we're watching that. We're watching something happen that's really, really bad. We're watching our young people being lied to by our media, lied to by colleges. We have allowed them to be schooled by professors, who have filled their heads with the benefits of socialism, about how America is structurally racist and defective society, and how free expression of opposing belief is violence. We've watched it, and it's scary. It goes on. The Anti-Defamation League has released a new report documenting a sizable increase this month in crimes and protests targeting Jews. Can you believe it? Uh, increased by 388% over the same period last year. It goes on because it's also a propaganda, a propaganda ploy. This article talks about despite Western media claims, Hamas enjoys widespread support in Gaza. Now again, I am against the war. I don't like to see innocent civilians killed. But let me tell you something, that there's a lot of civilians in Gaza that are not innocent. Yes, there are some, and they should get out. But look at your news. When you see the reports of Gaza, you'll see men, young men in the streets. You'll very rarely see any live shots of women or any children. Why? Because most of these men are radicalized. And so listen to the propaganda. Despite Western media claims, Hamas enjoys widespread support in Gaza. The propaganda in this war is unbelievable. The truth is that the majority of the, of the people are, being held, are not being held captive by Hamas. The population in Gaza supports Hamas. Uh, after two decades of research, the findings um, are that Hamas enjoys undisputed support um, among Gaza, Gaza's civilian population. Public opinion polls say Gazans today would re-elect them as their government as they did in 2006. In the 2006 Palestinian parliamentary elections, the last to be held in the Gaza Strip as well, Hamas won 76 of the 132 seats in the Palestinian Legislative Council. Hamas violently took control of the Strip in 2007, pushing out the PLO. And no general elections have been held in Gaza ever since. However, public opinion polls conducted in recent years indicates that the Gazan public continue to support Hamas even till today. According to the polls, approximately 65% of the Strip's residents on average support the armed struggle. <clears throat> Following the October 7th massacre, waves of Gazan civilians entered Israel and took part in the program. Footage from a security camera at a kibbutz Be'er Be'eri shows a mob of, Gaz of Gazan civilians invading the kibbutz to pillage it. You don't see that in the news. Gaza civilians also participated in the second wave of kidnappings of Israeli civilians to Gaza. People were abducted. Women and children to Gaza were not Hamas operatives, but rather ordinary Gazan civilians. In a propaganda, it's a propaganda lie that civilians can't leave Gaza. They don't want to leave because they support Hamas. Local journalists have reported undisputed public support uh, by, for crimes committed by Hamas. 
All available ed evidence indicates that approximately 65% of Gaza Strip's population supports Hamas and its armed struggle against Israel. The support is expressed both in polls and in their active participation in the organization's terrorist acts. This leads to the conclusion that claims regarding the existence of a clear ideological or political demarcation between the majority of Gaza's residents and Hamas are entirely unfounded. And this is going to shock you. A video was revealed last week, or excuse me, this week at the UN, as Israel released the audio recording of a terrorist who phoned his family to brag about his killings of Jews. The audio recording was found on the recovered phone of a murdered Israeli woman. The contents of the recording is this, and I'm quoting, Hi, Dad. I'm talking to you from Mephilism, a kibbutz in southern Israel. Open my WhatsApp now, and you'll see all those killed. Look how many I killed with my own hands. Your son killed Jews, the terrorist shouts enthusiastically. May God protect you, his father says, from inside Gaza. Dad, I'm talking to you from a Jewish woman's phone. I killed her, and I killed her husband. I killed ten with my own hands. God is great, the father, can, the father can be heard saying. The son then asked to speak to his mother, saying, quote, Their blood is on their hands. Put mom on. Oh, my son, God bless you, the father cries emotionally. The mother also expresses enthusiasm. Then the terrorist brother comes on the phone and tells him to come back home. What do you mean, come back? There is no going back. It's either death or victory. My mother gave birth to me for the religion, Allah. What's with you, Allah? That was his brother's name. How will I return? The terrorist answers. He then repeatedly urges his family to open WhatsApp to see all the pictures of the dead that he had sent them. This is absolutely demonic. We know that Hitler killed Jews, but he hid it. These people are not hiding their atrocities. They're proud of it. And, and secular people all around the world are praising them. It's an absolute madhouse. You can see how the enemy has just gripped our secular world. The propaganda continues. This is fuel tanks. Now listen well, because again, you're not going to hear this. We hear on the, new, on the news media that Israel has cut off supplies, they've cut off oil, they've cut off water, they've cut off food. First of all, before I even get into this article, what makes us think that you should supply all those things to your enemy? If Canada was raining down bombs on us, will we supply them with food and clothing and shelter and, and money? Israel does all of that. Will we allow some of their people to come in and give them visas, work visas in America, knowing that they hate us and knowing that they'll bomb us at any time and knowing that there's terrorists that come across the border? Of course we wouldn't. The propaganda is ridiculous. But let's, let me give you another one that's equally ridiculous. Propaganda wars. Israel releases photos of massive Hamas fuel stockpiles. Israel, again, cut off fuel to Gaza, but listen to it. Israeli authorities released on Tuesday aerial images of Hamas storage tanks in the, in the Gaza Strip containing at least a half a million liters of fuel, saying that fuel shortages should be addressed to the Islamic group and not to Jerusalem. If there's any fuel shortages for their people, it's not Israel's fault. It's Hamas. They're hoarding the fuel. Why? For their military operations. Hamas, <clears throat> Hamas um, owns these fuel tanks, certainly uh, hundred, containing hundreds of thousands of liters of fuel. Um, Hamas has fuel. Hamas has quite a lot of fuel. IDF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Karikas told CNN's Wolf Blitzer, and they can decide where to use that fuel. And I find it strikingly absent from the discussion what is Hamas doing with the resources that it has? Why aren't questions posed to Hamas? Why isn't the media asking Hamas? Why don't you release the, the food and the supplies, the medical supplies and the fuel that you have to your own citizens? Why don't you use some of the fuel you have stockpiled and hoarded in advance of this situation and use it for your own civilians? We are not ob obliged to provide any aid to an enemy entity that uses all the energy and resources it has to kill our civilians and fight us. Is that not logical? I mean, everybody should think that. Hamas has stockpiled fuel and water that it could provide to hospitals, but it doesn't. That out of compassion and understanding, Israel has set up a humanitarian zone in the south of the Strip and allowed aid to flow to Palestinian civilians when Hamas will not even allow that. Some have questioned Israel's decision to allow goods to enter Gaza Strip, particularly as Hamas still holds more than 220 hostages taken during the October 7th massacre. And aid for civilians in the past has been systematically diverted to the terrorist group. Even UNRWA, that's the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, don't forget that, for Palestinian refugees in the Near East has been described as an extension of Hamas. Now listen to how wild this gets. 
UNRWA is a very problematic organization. It is fully controlled by Hamas. Hamas uses the facilities of UNRWA for weapons and storage and to launch rockets. Uh, all of the local employees of UNRWA are Hamas people. Nobody's allowed to work in UNRWA without the permission of Hamas. On Tuesday, UNRWA uh, posted a so on social media that without fuel, I'm quoting, it won't be able to carry out humanitarian efforts in the Gaza Strip. The Israeli Defense Forces quickly responded to the message <clears throat> with an aerial photograph that showed, you're looking at it in that chart, that showed 12 large white vats lined up in two rows. These are fuel tanks inside Gaza. They contain more than 500,000 liters of fuel, the IDF posted. Ask Hamas if you can have some. That volume is about 132,000 gallons. The IDF on Thursday also provided audio of evidence that Hamas is forcibly preventing Palestinians from heeding Israeli orders to evacuate to the south of the Gaza Strip. It's blocking roads. He answers in the affirmative, saying that Hamas was preventing passage south through Salah al-Din Road, the main road north-south highway running through Gaza Strip. Hamas is sending drivers back in harm's way in the north by placing vehicles on the road. They're shooting at people, the Gazan civilian says. So let's go a little bit further and tell you some more ridiculous things that's going on. The, this, is, this is the squad. AOC blames Christian fundamentalists. She blames us for fueling Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The country that is Israel today is not the Israel of the Bible, said Ocasio-Cortez. The country that is Israel today was established in this century. That is an ignorant lie. In the United States, she said of America, Christian fundamentalism, that's us, and nationalism, which has also been extremely anti-Semitic, has also aligned itself with some of the most right-wing and authoritarian and inflammatory powers in the region. I'm quoting again from her. It's not a coincidence that when Trump was in power, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, said Ocasio-Cortez. There is a ton of fundamental literature around Revelation. She says Revelations. She doesn't know her Bible. It's Revelation. In the Bible, that leads people to pro project incorrectly, she says, by the way. Evangelical Christians, a large cons constituency within the Rep Republican Party, who uh, for decades show support for Israel and its biblical right to the land. Despite AOC, AOC's claim to the contrary, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has praised evangelical Christians as Israel's strongest supporters. One only needs to look at those coming out to support Israel during its time of need right now as churches are filled with prayer for Israel and her hostages. Christian evangelical media has been full of support for Israel during its current conflict, and numerous organizations, Christians, are working to get needed supplies to Israel. She went on in her verbal diarrhea, to state that Republicans in Congress were trying to turn the United States into a far-right Christian theocracy for their opposition to abortion. She criticized the Christian campaign ad, saying it is a positive spin on fascism. Something tells me Jesus would not spend millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads to make fascism look benign, Ocasio Cortez told her over 13 million Twitter followers. I wonder that what that something is that told her, or who that something is. Maybe it's Satan. She was responding to a Christian ad campaign called He Gets Us, funded by the same family behind craft store chain Hobby Lobby. Lee Zimba, a former football player from Auburn University, offered a summary of Ocasio Cortez's logic. Quote, love your enemy equates to fascism? Zimba asked, tweeting a cry, laughing emoji. You're brilliant, he wrote. Attorney Eric Owen said that Ocasio Cortez was missing the entire point of the commercial. That's your take from a great Super Bowl ad reminding us of the truth that hate is bad? Owen said, are you serious? An intern is writing your tweets while you wear a fancy dress to the Super Bowl ball. Are you a theologian now, he asks? What can you not do? Another user asked the congresswoman. Sadly, AOC has been praised by some progressive publications as the future of the Catholic Church and a politician who speaks with passion about her Christian faith. Wow, AOC as a representative of Jesus, Whew. I think she's just like Judas was, not Jesus, Judas, because she is a Judas. She's betraying the word, she's betraying Christianity. Let's go a little bit further and show you this one. No doubt you've heard about it. Airport shock. Enraged Muslims mob storms airport hunting for Jews. This is unreal. 
Appalling videos emerging from Russia show a large mob storming the Dagestan airport Sunday as Muslim men chant Allah Akbar while hunting for Jews believed to be on a flight from Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, the airport uh, in Maka Kalala uh, was closed due to the situation and riot police have, police have been deployed. The flight, which took off from Ben Gurion International Airport in Israel and was scheduled to land in Makalaka, was rerouted and landed at a different airport. Video posted online shows the demonstrators carrying Palestinian flags and clashing with police late Sunday evening. One video shows the mob, numbering in the hundreds according to reports, circling around a man they suspected as being a Jew, as he claimed to be Uzbekistan, Uzbekian. The mob does not believe him and instead takes his passport and his phone to check it out. Are you kidding me? How in the world do we get to this point? How in the world do we get back to pre-World pre War II? Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, responded to the video saying this, quote, Israel expects the Russian legal authorities to safeguard the well-being of all Israeli citizens and Jews wherever they are and to take strong action against the rioters and against the wild incitement being directed against Jews and Israelis. This is pre-World War II. In pre-World War II, the Jews were harassed all over the world and they were forced to try to, to, they were forced out of businesses. Nazi Germany came to the conclusion of it by the final solution by eradicating all of them. Every time there's a world war, whether World War I, World War II, even, beyond, even before that, in ancient times, Greek times, and Roman times, the Jews were persecuted. The Jews were, there is a massive war coming. I could read history, and history tells us that. Why in the world? There's like 14 million Jews in the world, a very minimal population of the 8 billion people that are in the world. You have to ask yourself a question. Why such hatred worldwide? To the Jews. Is this not Satan in his, in his push? Why would he do it? I'll tell you why. Because he knows scripture better than we do. He knows that Christ is going to come back and rule through the nation of Israel for 1,000 years. The messianic rule. And so we know the, the millennial rule of Christ. So we know it's going to happen. So does he. He hates Jews. He's always hated them. And that's what you're seeing today. You're seeing Jew hatred at its height because Satan is at his height. Let's go a little bit further before I get really kind of involved in this. Let's talk about our own border. Conservatives warn southern border leaves America as vulnerable as Israel. It's coming. As the Mideastern violence con uh, continues, conservatives in the United States are warning that open border policies and leftist weaponization of defense and law enforcement institutions are leaving America vulnerable to similar attacks. On Monday, former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy cautioned, we should wake up ourselves we could have the same thing happen next week to us. He added, we caught more people on the terrorist watch list in February than we caught in the entire administra administration. We could have cells sitting right now inside of American. Uh, your intel is never perfect. And we've got a wide open border. They're coming in for a, from 160 different countries. Former President Donald Trump said a bunch of the same thing, posting on social media this week. The same people that raided Israel are pouring into our once beautiful USA through our totally open southern border at record numbers. Are they planning an attack within our country, he asks. Pointing to the violence in the Middle East, Republican presidential candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis called on the U.S. to immediately shut down America's wide open southern border to ensure that we are in a position to better protect Americans here at home from these real threats. It's a national security problem and we should have a Biden impeached because he is, he is threatening our national security. Adding to the concern, a new Homeland Security report warns that Border Patrol agents have caught more than 24,000 migrants from China crossing illegally into the United States, mostly men of war age, this fiscal year alone, including 11,000 just since June of this year. That's a 1,115% increase from 2021 when American officials encountered only a thousand from the communist country. Customs and Border Protection has encountered, has encountered over seven million illegal aliens since January 2021 who have poured across President Joe Biden's open border. It doesn't include the more than 1.5 million known gotaways who evaded border, border control. So why would he keep it open? I'm sure people are asking that. Well, it's easy. 
He gives them free health care, gives them free phones, puts them up in hotels for free, gives them free Vespas, little motorcycles to run around in. They don't have to do anything. All they need to do is vote for him. Vote Democratic. That's why he's doing it. It's for votes. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me and he doesn't care about America. And it's not even him. We know that there's people backing him. He's just a talking suit. We know that there's others that are there. Two days before the attack on Israel, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, he needs to be fired, released a statement reaffirming the administration's opposition to border walls. Since the attack on Israel, there's been no indication of a change in course from the Biden administration. Let me tell you that Israel has the most secure border walls on the planet, and they were breached. Could you imagine if there were no border walls? Could you imagine the massacre then? The reprehensible attack carried out by Hamas began with an incursion across a border Israelis assumed was secure. Americans have to question those in power about what is being done to secure our own borders and ensure that anyone who would threaten American lives cannot freely pass into America or remain in this country. And now we don't even know where they are. Uh, Mayorkas was asked by a congressional committee yesterday, where are they? Do you have any idea where they are? He avoided the question. This is my opinion. We need to put a wall around our border. And while we're at it, we pr it would probably be a great idea to put a wall around Biden and his administration to protect us from him. Let's go a little bit further. Speaking of war, let's talk about our Navy. U.S. Navy prepares for war by hiring another gender and sexuality professor. In the midst of an all-out global war that seems imminent, the Naval Academy has decided to put their efforts not into lethal combat training, you'd think they would, but gender and sexuality studies. The Navy hiring gender and sexuality experts and featuring drag queens in recruitment videos. And it's not just the Naval Academy. The US Military Academy, considered among the most prestigious universities in the nation, has also incorporated gender and sexuality into Army officer education. West Point and the Air Force Academy even offers a minor in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Additionally, Nellis Air Force Base has developed a track record of hosting drag shows regardless of opposition. General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, denied that the armed forces were going woke. Rather, he stated it was a complicated topic he was not going to, dis to address. That's ridiculous. Lieutenant General retired William Boykin, executive vice president of FRC, also shared his concern with TWS, um, the Wall Street Journal, stating that the hiring of a gender and sexuality studies professor for the Naval Academy is another example of how unaware this administration is in training and preparing young men and women for war and to be victorious. He emphasized the Navy seems oblivious to what the midshipmen really need. Experts say that not only is this topic being overcomplicated by the LGBT narrative, it is also having devastating consequences on recruitment. It's the worst years for recruitment ever. No one wants to join the woke Navy, Army, and Air Force. As military institutions prioritize gender and sexuality education and recruitment suffers, China is taking advantage of our distracted world to deport hundreds of North Korean defectors back into North Korea, where they'll almost certainly be sent to forced labor camps. The West's influence is on decline, and the East is seeking to take its place, the Thucydides effect. As Boykin stated plainly, it's time for the Navy and all other services to wake up and start providing good leadership. Let me give you my opinion again. Biden wants to be remembered as the first president to normalize and incorporate the LGBTQ population into American society. But I believe he'll be remembered as the first president who ever killed the American society because he's on his way to doing just that, putting us in harm's way. I, I hope, I pray I'm wrong. America is not listed in, not referenced in Bible prophecy. I wonder if she will even be here. I wonder if somebody will, won't destroy us. I pray I am wrong. But the way Biden's going, he is putting us in harm's way day after day after day. A lot of in the news tonight. Let's go right here to the, to the economy. Follow the money trail. The millionaires of Hamas. You hear me, right? Millionaires of Hamas. It's not an oxymoron. They have millionaires. I'll tell you they are and the poor residents of Gaza. The Arabs living in the Gaza Strip are suffering. Thousands of Hamas terrorists are using them as human shields, making it hard for them to get out. Economic hardship has been the lot of those living in Gaza and the West Bank. Yes, this yet this hardship 
is not shared by their leaders. A Saudi Arabian publication quotes a senior Palestinian Authority official as saying that roughly 1,700 senior Hamas officials are millionaires. You repeat that. 1,700 senior Hamas officials are millionaires. Now you wouldn't think that when you see all the pictures on CNN of all the devastation and all the, all the, poor, the poor people in, in Gaza, but 1,700 of Hamas leaders are millionaires. Hamas leader Ishmael Hania holds an estimated personal fortune of roughly, you ready for it? $4 billion. Another, Khaled Mashal, claims to, to have a cool $5 billion. Yet the Gazan Arabs suffer. The unemployment rate in Gaza is 49%. And more than 85% of the population lives in poverty. Just listen to this. This is who's ruling these people. Yet Hamas just launched an armed force of thousands equipped with rockets and drones and has built a vast web of tunnels under Gaza. Where did they get the money to do that? Well, obviously they have money. Their people don't, but they do. The tunnels, which Hamas admits to my total of more than 300 miles in length, are used to smuggle in all manners of goods and are also used to transport people and goods to store rockets and ammunition caches and house Hamas command and control centers. Hamas exists to destroy Israel, but it supports itself through an extensive and complex financial network. Most of Hamas's budget, roughly 300 million, comes from taxes on businesses as well as from countries including Iran and Qatar or charities. Hamas has a portfolio that includes a cryptocurrency component that estimates its secret network of companies are managing $500 million of investments in Turkey and Saudi Arabia. At the same time, humanitarian aid has flowed into Gaza for years. The Associated Press reports that from 2014 to 2020, UN agencies spent nearly $4.5 billion in Gaza, including $600 million in 2020 alone. The lion's share of this is coming from the United States and Qatar, 13 billion in 2012. Um, and for construction, it, for, it's supposed to be for construction of health services and agriculture, with tens of millions of dollars also being given by Egypt, Derm Germany, and other European nations. It's an economic black hole. That money's going into the Hamas leaders, and it's going into all their military. Their people are starving to death. Given the relatively small population of Gaza, about two million people, and the substantial funding provided for them, the years both before and after Hamas's iron grip should have been growing, growing prosperity. They have some beautiful beaches that go down the Mediterranean. They could have put hotels on that. They could have made that a peaceful area. People could have, could have come to Israel and tourists could have gone to, to Gaza, to some of the beaches and some of the places to, to dive and to, and to have luxury hotels. Instead, hundreds of thousands of Arabs in this tiny strip of land, it's only about 140 square miles, they are languishing in poverty. It's not hard to conclude that Hamas has for many years siphoned the funding away from the needy people it ostensibly represents for the bank accounts of its scandalously wealthy leaders and its increasingly well-armed military wing. For example, since October 7th, Hamas has fired 7,000 rockets into Israel. What is less known, well known, is that in 2021, Hamas shot more than 3,600 missiles into Israel. The sheer volume of these attacks indicates that substantial money investment has been made for many, many years to build such an arsenal. It's heartbreaking to consider sad fate of people, the majority of whom would likely want to live in peace and in a place of peace, in a place of stability and economic opportunity. It outrages any sense of justice to think they're under the control of the cruel thumb of an organization inflamed by anti-Semitic hatred and led by paragons of greed. Once and for all, Israel needs the tools, the military, the material, and the funding to siphon away the moral bile which Hamas inflicts in Gaza's entire system. In other words, they need to destroy Hamas as conclusively and as quickly as possible. Another one. Nightmare scenario. Expanded war spirals global financial crisis. All over America, borrowers are getting behind on their payments. Subprime Subprime borrowers are struggling to pay their bills, just like they have in the last financial crisis. The percent of subprime auto borrowers, at least 60 days past due on their, on their loans, rose to 7% in September. We have never seen a number this high until during the Great Recession. Credit card delinquency rates at small banks have hit an all-time high. 7.65%, the highest level ever recorded. Once again, we never saw a number this high during the Great Recession. Needless to say, 
It isn't the wealthy that are getting behind on their credit card payments. Instead, it's ordinary Americans that are deeply struggling to pay bills in this harsh economic environment. Alarmingly, early stage mortgage delinquencies are also spiking. Foreclosures have started to jump again at a pace that's absolutely breathtaking. Again, let me jump in here. Bidenomics, are you kidding me? Should be called nightmare-nomics. Can you think of any other ways to kill our country? I don't know. Let's give him some time. I'm sure he'll come up with some more in, insane ideas to hurt us. The article goes on. Nowadays, a reckoning has arrived, and there are many that simply can't keep up with all their payments. Percentage of Californians living in poverty jumped from 11% in 2021 to 17% last year. What will the final number for 2023 be? Will it be above 20%? The economy is moving in the wrong direction very, very rapidly now. And the war in the Middle East hasn't even fully erupted yet. So what in the world will conditions look like once that happens? Our economic prosperity is completely and utterly dependent on cheap energy. Listen to me well. This war in the Middle East is going to boil down to energy. Without it, everything will change. Once the flow of Middle Eastern oil stops due to the war, the price of oil is going to go completely nuts. Once that happens, a nightmare scenario could quickly unfold. Here's what could happen. The conflict escalates into a regional war with the U.S. becoming directly involved. OPEC responds with an oil embargo. Iran closes the Strait of Hormuz. The price of oil reaches $300 a barrel. Europe succumbs into a full-blown energy crisis due to the shortage. Massive spikes in energy prices and inflation goes crazy. Financial markets and global banking sectors collapse. Debt crisis engulfs the United States forcing the Federal Reserve to enact yet another financial market bailout. Petrodollar trade collapses. Hyperinflation emerges. I don't think that's too far from the truth. And the truth is that the banks are the beating heart of our entire financial system. We are so close to a full-blown economic meltdown, it's not even funny. The only thing that could really save us now is if peace broke out in the Middle East. Unfortunately, that's not going to be a time, there's not going to be a time of peace. This is going to be a time of war. So that means that extremely harsh economic conditions are ahead of us. And most Americans are completely and utterly unprepared and unknowledgeable about such a reality. So we are looking at dire times. I would love, I say this all the time, to give you great news. The great news is going to come through the Word of God and through God's provision for us. But our world is going to hell in a handbasket. And America is leading the way. Well, let me give you a little bit of bright hope. Not that there's a whole lot, but this is our new Speaker of the House. Uh, Mike Johnson, but he's been attacked already for believing basic Christian doctrines. So, although Johnson's unexpected rise to the speakership was welcomed by conservatives, the left has predictably been apoplectic in denouncing Speaker Johnson's long-standing social conservative views. For example, some House Democrats took exception to the portion of Johnson's speech on Wednesday, in which the new speaker referenced God, Welcome to the Republican era of not even pretending they aren't forcing their religion on Congress and the American people, one of the, the uh, Jared Huffman, a Democrat from California, said. Jamie Raskin, a Democrat, tweeted Mike, Speaker Mike Johnson, anti-choice, anti-LGBTQ, anti-gun safety, anti-democracy. This is what theocracy looks like, God rule. In his speech, Johnson stated, I don't believe there are any coincidences in a matter like this. I believe that scripture that tells us that God raises up those in authority. He raised each of you, all of us, and I believe God has ordained and allowed each of us to be brought here for this specific moment in this time. He spoke that to Congress. Thank God. Far from advancing a theocratic overtaker of the House of Representatives, Johnson's comments merely reflect well-known biblical passages such as Daniel 2.21 which states that God controls things, changes the seasons, removes kings, sets up one, puts down another. To put it simply, Johnson's understanding that God is the one that raises up those in authority is a widely held Christian belief that has been taught for centuries, when I believe. The fact that, that articulating this basic conviction triggered ominous warnings of an impending theocracy demonstrates the ever-widening gulf between those with a biblical worldview and those without one. Johnson's past comments on same-sex marriage, abortion, and homosexuality were immediately targeted. Other criticism came from the DNC chair, Jamie Harrison, who released a statement describing Johnson as an anti-abortion MAGA extremist. They went on and on. I could tell you, Sarah Posner, a contributor for MSNBC, also pointed to Johnson's pro-life record as proof that he is the most unabashedly Christian nationalist speaker in history. Great! 
I'm, I'm excited about that. The criticism and denunciations of Johnson are predictable. The newly elected Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is a Southern Baptist who subscribes to the basic tenets of the Christian faith. The opposition party are working overtime to convince the nation that Johnson is a Christian nationalist with outdated, subversive policy views. That characterization could not be further from the truth. Johnson's views are in line with an overwhelming percentage of American Christians who share the Speaker's worldview. As this is good news for Republicans, but more importantly, good news for America at a time when convictional, principled leadership is sorely needed. So if you want to pray for somebody today, pray for Mike Johnson. Listen to what he said here. He says, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's my worldview. I love that. We're going to start into our Jude study. Hold on one second. We're going to take a I am sorry, we were just told that our live stream was going back and forth, so some of you are probably uh, texting saying that that's what's happening. So we're gonna reboot. Uh, you can get the in the news on, um, it'll be back on, we'll have it on when? Tomorrow, tomorrow on Facebook and on uh, YouTube. So if you want the news, don't forget, tomorrow Mark Rell Ministries on Facebook and on YouTube. We're gonna take a five minute break so we can reboot everything so I can give you this Jude study. I am sorry for our technical difficulties, we'll be back in five minutes.